Hello guys, so welcome to this first uh, webinar from the Technocreatives. Um, this is, as you're all aware of, a kind of new situation because we were planning to actually be on a fair at this stage and we were talking about talking about the advanced engineering fair. But as it got cancelled, we had to do something because we're not just laying down on our back and waiting for better times. We are changing and we are moving ahead. So that's why we decided to run a webinar instead and this webinar is going to be first we have a, a short in, um, short introduction from from the advanced engineering and then we're going to run a short uh, speech around golden rich robotics which is one of the companies that we founded and that we're running and then we're going to pivot and go into iot and business models and talk a little bit about how we work with it and what we do and who are we and who are we so i'm uh, that's a good question <laughs> So I'm Joel Rossara, uh, I'm the founder and CEO of the Technocredits and... I'm Oscar Hogberg, I'm the CTO here at the Technocredits. Yes, and for you guys and for us, this is a all new situation, I would say. So I hope it, it works, the technology with us, but it seems promising. So let's let's run it. And we are testing. So we had the first little issue here, <laughs> of course. So um, we're going to have a short intro from, from the advanced engineering fair that got postponed. But, but the fair will be back. Um, in fall, right? But the new date, I'm not sure. In September. September, I think. Yes. Yeah. So let's see. Hi everyone, my name is Tom. Esther Fardell and I'm the project manager of the trade show Advanced Engineering here in Gothenburg. 
As you all are aware of, the government set up restrictions sure, sure. about um, meetings and events of more than 500 people on March 11. And this made us put on our show until the yeah. 2nd and 3rd September this autumn. And actually, we feel that we this is the, the greatest thing okay. that could happen Obviously. because we, um, we have health as our highest priority, of course. Um, also, I'm happy to announce that we will have an intact show program. And that you will find, for example, ABB, Volvo Cars, and the Techno Creatives on the show floor. Uh, actually, we had exhibitors joining us as late as last week. So the work with this show will not stop. Um, we, we will just try and find new ways uh, of serving our communities. And setting up a webinar like this is one great example of, of what we will have to do more of in the future. So we strongly believe that uh, product development, which is the focus for this show, uh, will have to uh, and will continue even through Corona. Uh, we think that in this, uh, when we reach the autumn this year, um, finding the right partners and the right solutions to your great ideas will be even more crucial uh, and to, to adapt to, to this new reality that we will face. So um, the Techno Creatives is the first one out to offer yeah, uh, a, a webinar there. and this one will be about least, yeah. enabling business yeah, models yeah, yeah. through yes, iot okay. something well, that yeah. i believe will have a great it's value lighting. in the future so thank you the techno creatives for doing this and take it away bye all right cool All right, uh, so we got, we, we're going to be back at this fair and we're going to have a booth and we're going to showcase the vehicle that, that we're going to talk a little bit about right now. And we're going to bring some other technology because we think that technology is something that you should touch and feel and you should get your hands on it. It's much more exciting than, than just to read about it or look at it. Um, all right, so we're going to start with a short introduction of the Technocratives. And we have the slides. We have the slides? Yes. Yes. So the Technic Credits, we're a company here in, in Gothenburg, Gothenburg in Sweden. And we're around 50 people. We have two offices. We have this one in Gothenburg. And we have a studio in Shenzhen, China. The reason we're in China is that most of the technology that's built in the world is actually made in China, the hardware itself. So to get their hands on, on the components and to get access to firmware and to the supply chain, we need to be there. So we have an office and we have a team of five engineers in China. Um, and back in Gothenburg, we cover design and engineering, software engineering and strategy. And the thing we do at, at this company is that we're building a lot of different uh, technology solutions is all always pivoting around software, but the software is usually connected to hardware somewhere. And I think this is maybe a difference to, to some other companies that all everything we do is always a machine in the other end, or more or less. Sometimes we do other stuff as well. But we are we love hardware and we're very close to hardware. Uh, we like the industry. We like machines that actually change something physically in the world. So this is what we're focusing on. Uh, we have a lot of large customers like you of course the automotive industry and and but but many of them are outside the automotive industry and typically like a german sme player which is like one to three billion euros in, in revenue that's a typical type of client we have um, but they span from around the biggest companies in the world like like volkswagen down to small startups okay. 
And what, what we work with, what we do, this is also the speech that we're going to have here, where we had exactly this model. So we start with experimenting and we're building proof of concepts and MVPs. And we're also working with, with product development and product launch and scaling. And we think that, that this is something that is quite easy to do in theory and you read a lot about it. But it's, it's quite hard to do it in the right way if you want to do it in the real life, real world. The reason it's kind of hard to do is that it takes a lot of effort and it takes a lot of money and resources to actually build and launch things. And, and when you're experimenting, you want to get out in the real world because if you do it in a lab, if you do it in your own office, or if you do it in, in just a very, very small scale, you don't get the real data behind it. So this model, we're going to go back to this one several times. And, and this is what we've done in, in Golda Rich Robotics that I'm going to talk about. This company, the Technocreative, we span our work from working with product-based or time-based. This is like regular consulting. We have pivoted away from the traditional um, uh, resource consulting. And we took that decision a number of years ago and thought that we need our team to be here working together. And we can't just send the people out to the clients and work as a resource consultant. Um, this is also be because of this, we have customers all over the world because it's much easier uh, to get a product here than actually send people to, to Canada or US or China or Japan or something. But to bring the product here is, is much easier. So this is what we do. This business model we have, it's also including that we are sharing risk with the clients quite often. So we have a license model that we can work with, with uh, either a license or a success fee or something like that. And we're also starting companies with co-funding and, and starting other ventures together with the industry or by ourselves. And one of these companies that we started is Golden Rich Robotic. What is Golden Rich Robotic and, and why do we want to talk about it? Um, Golden Rich Robotic is an autonomous micromobility electric vehicle. And if it would be a concept, it would be one among many, we think, because you see these concepts on different fairs. Maybe not right now because all the fairs are cancelled, but you see the concepts everywhere. And there's a lot of concept cards and so on. But this is not just a concept. This is something we launched and it's in production and it's also in public. You can pay for it and you can run it. And this company, it looks like this, the, the vehicle. And, and one of the big thing with it is that we have a partner here, which is called Baidu. And Baidu is sort of the Chinese version of Google. It's the biggest search engine in, in China. And Baidu is doing, as Google, a lot of different things. And one of the things they do is that they are running a company called Apollo. And Apollo is a little bit similar to Google Waymo, if you're familiar with Google, Google Waymo. And Apollo is a platform and technology for autonomous vehicles and autonomous drive. So this vehicle we've been building and we're co-founding, it's based on the Apollo, Baidu Apollo platform. Um, and, um, and we're launching. So uh, this little vehicle, it looks like a, sort of a golf cart. It is not for golf, it's actually for parks. Um, to, to tell you a little bit about this use case, because for, for us in Sweden or in Europe, or maybe in US, it, it sounds and it feels awkward. Why do you run this and, and what is it? And basically you go around in different parks for leisure. So you rent the vehicle, instead of walking around, you, you drive around in this one instead. And I would say it looks a little bit like in, in some parks, you have this little uh, paddle boat that you go around with, and it's, it feels okay to rent that one because of course you cannot walk on water. But so the business model makes sense. But for China, this autonomous little vehicle in the parks, this is exi an existing user behavior. So people are renting it and, and they are running around with it. The thing that we've done here is that it's, it's very easy to rent because we integrated all the existing ecosystem with Alipay and WeChat and, and similar to be able to pay for it and sign up for it. In China, so you use a smartphone. You, you, go, you go up with your smartphone and, and you can rent it for a day or or, day. or an hour. Yeah, yeah. exactly. So so to get access to it in in China, we have a, a much easier way of using services because there's an existing infrastructure for payment, for example. Yeah, everyone's using WeChat Pay or Alipay, and you have a credit system as well, so you know who's who's renting it, and, and uh, it's pretty safe. It's pretty safe. 
back in Europe and in the US, you need to sign up to a service, you need to uh, register your credit card or similar. I think this is about to change now with Apple Pay and, and, and similar services, but of course it will pay. The other part of this uh, little vehicle is that it's, it's kind of comfortable. It's like a little couch you're running around with. And the system is also smart, so we can distribute the vehicles wherever we want, and we can drive them by, by itself. Uh, the autonomous drive functions can also inhibit if you want to go chase, chasing ducks or st stuff like that, and you're not allowed to do it. The system kicks in and, and limits your ability to drive wherever you want because you're not allowed to do it. Um, is it just a concept? No, it's not a concept. This is, to repeat, this is the big difference here. And we do a lot of concept cars for automotive industry. Uh, we have done, how many concept cars have we done? Countless. Countless. <laughs> 10, 20 concept cars. Yeah. And they're exciting and fun and they show on technology and on a future business model. But we also like to run stuff for real. Because when you run stuff in the real world, you get much more data that you can actually base your future business model and your future company on. And this is not a concept. Uh, we actually have a number of buildings. And this is one of the buildings we have. And, and it's Baidu and Apollo and Golden Rich on, on top of it. When you're talking about startups and you're talking about China, things are in a different scale. So this is, a, I would say, a normal sized startup in China, which means that we have like 50, 60 employees and quite, quite some funding and running quite fast. Um, we launched um, big last year and you actually mm. went there. Yeah, this was the uh, Baidu Developer Conference in Beijing, uh, where the uh, rover that we built was part of their announcement for rolling out real products with their Apollo platform. Yes. So here we managed to get Baidu on board on this one. And how do you manage to get some a player like Google or Baidu or Amazon or something on top of on, on, to play together with you? And one of the reasons were that we were looking for a, a area where we could launch the service very fast. And these guys, they're also looking for something that you can launch. So if you say that you want to run a robo taxi, it's quite hard to get it approved and to run it in real world. So I don't think that they will be so interested right now. They're running their own examples of this one. But if you manage to launch an autonomous electric service within a field where you're allowed to run it, they, they will be much more interested. And, and this is a proof of that one. So this is the big launch of it. Um, OK, how did we get here? How did we manage to build an autonomous electric little vehicle with a new type of business model and launch it in, in quite a little time. We've been working with this one in maybe two, three years, mm -hmm. something like that. Um, we, we base it on something that we are doing for many, many products. We try to get evidence because we think that we are smart and we have the answers and we know the truth out there, but of course we don't. We just make big guesses. And, and you can basically never really tell how people will react. I think very few people could actually understand what would happen with the world right now in this crisis. And some, some other parts with the coronavirus right now, I think is part of the, of the virus. And the other big impact of the world is actually how people behave and what they do. And this is interesting because when you're running a service and when you're building a product, you want to understand exactly how people react and what they do, not what you think they will do but actually get evidence, get the truth. How do you get the truth? You collect data. Of course, the data is the evidence. It tells you how people react. And then we can go into different parts of the data because data right now, it can be about user behavior. It could be about the business model. It could be about market size and, and technology itself in this case. So you need to validate basically all of these different sections for it. And, and especially for Golden, some services you've built is maybe more dependent on trying to enhance a certain part of a, of a supply chain, or it could be that you are predict maintenance or something like that. But for Golden Rich, we have a new product, we have a new type of user behavior, we have a new business model, we have a new technology, how to run it. So you need to go through all of this. And the first one is the business model. How do you validate the business model? What do you do? And one of the first questions is, is just a theoretical part. Is it big enough? And, and does it make sense? Can you go after this market? 
And you can do this on paper, basically. So you do a number of research and running an electric micromobility service in China, in parks, only in parks, how big is that market? And we looked at the 40,000 biggest parks in China. China is big, if you didn't know, 40,000 biggest parks. Today, it's already existing 2 million vehicles in these parks. 2 million electric vehicles and, and bike pedaled vehicles that you can rent by the hour or by the day. So it's, it's a, already a huge market out there. And this is something we like because when you're innovating on something, you don't want to be innovating on business model, on technology, on accessing the market. You, you should be innovating on only one part because if you need to innovate on everything, the chance of you're not succeeding in one or the area, it will just kill your business. So if you can, if you can rely on something existing, it's much, much better. Um, and, and here it comes. So when you have a new market like this one, you need to go there. You need to understand the user behavior and, and the world is different. American people are acting in a different way than European people and, and Chinese, China and, and other Asian countries and so on. So it's very important to take your technology, adapt it and go to, to your market and test it there. And I think with technology right now, we're also in a shift where we're building more and more unique and specialized type of technology and vehicles and machines. And these machines will have a leverage in their particular market. Mm -hmm. and, and previously we built a car and the car looked the same all over the world. But right now we're changing. So in some parts of the world, you, you will not be able to run a gasoline powered mm -hmm. car for, for many more years, for example. So more of these niches, but a niche can turn out to be pretty big yes. in this case. And, and the basic question is, is the market big enough? That's the most important part of it. And when you understand that, yes, it's big enough, you can look at the unit economics. Does it make sense? If you get a single sale, do you earn money on it? And Golden Rich Robotic is renting out vehicles. And then there's two big assets. One is the vehicle itself that you can transport people in. And the other big asset is the park that you're visiting. And we're gonna go back to a use case where we have the big panda park in Chengdu. Where, where they have most of the pandas in the world. And, and basically all pandas in other parks, that is in, in yeah, theme parks and so on, they are actually rented from this park in China. Um, so people go there to look at pandas and they don't want to walk around, they want to go around the little vehicle, so they rent the vehicle. And we have a revenue share model here where we get 60% of revenue and the park itself get 40% of revenue. So it's a win-win situation. For it. It's quite easy, quite similar to an Uber or yeah. other business model. And the park handles the vehicle and maintains it and will yeah. run the service on top of it. Exactly. So, so this, this is also an ecosystem where we see that the, the park is not just handling and have, owning the ground and, and the attraction. It's also actually helping us with, with moving around the vehicles and, and storing the vehicles and, and stuff like that. The other part of that you do when you have a business model is, and you see that the market is big enough, it's a different question because it's, it's can you access the market? It's not enough that you say there's a lot of parks out there, you can rent the vehicle in these parks, there are a lot of people doing it, and so it should be enough. And no one wanna sign up. If the parks don't wanna sign up to your service, how are you gonna access them? And if you go to other like consumer electronics and stuff, it's much more how, it's not that you convert and get people to buy for a watch, for example, to get to buy your product. It's much harder to actually get the product in front of the customer. How do you get them to, to, to take that decision to buy it or not buy it? This is how you access the market. And this is also sort of a free from technology solution. So what we did here is that we negotiated with different parks. It's traditional sales. We have a pitch, we show them the vehicle, we show them the service and the business model, and we make them sign up. So before Christmas, we managed to sign up 81 parks. Uh, last number I heard is that we had 104 parks signed up, and we know that we can reach them. So we have proof here. We know the market is big enough, and we have evidence and proof that we, they will sign up. So we know this is a, a slide from the pitch deck. So it says 43. We now have 80, 83 before 
Christmas, and we are now up to 104 signed up parks. And we know that we can sign up 400 parks this year. This is, this is the goal for this year. Let's see what happened with, with uh, the crisis now and, and how that affects. But we know we can scale. And we think and we know that we can scale next year as well. And this future number, they go much more into production. How many vehicles can we actually produce for this one? The next part that you need to validate now is the technology part. And that's why I think while you're listening to, to this uh, little podcast and, and webinar, and it's also the core of what we do. And when you talk about technology, the, the interesting thing here is that what is your unfair advantage? What can you do with technology that makes your product and your service stand out against the competitors? What's the unfair advantage? And in this case, how do you validate that you do have an unfair advantage? And for Golden Rich Robotic, it's quite easy to understand that, of course, it's electric. There is other vehicles electric. But the big thing is this is autonomous. It can drive by itself. And why do you need to, to drive by yourself if, if you're doing it for leisure? Of course, you can sit down and relax. But the big change here is that you can pick up a vehicle and you can drop it off wherever you want. And we can run the vehicle back to its starting point. We can distribute the whole system. We don't need any staff to actually go collect the vehicle and bring it to you or take it to the charging point or stuff like that. The whole system is autonomous. We can distribute everything. Okay, how do you collect data? How do you do that in this case? And in Golden Ridge, um, you built a number of vehicles. This is not the production. This is actually just uh, pre-samples or prototype, prototypes. They look sort of like they, they will do in, the, in production, but underneath the hood, it's very handmade, handmade. handmade. Yeah. but even a handmade sample is the right cameras and it's the right technology. So we can run it around. And now we're going to see if the technology actually are working with us here and not lagging too much. And so we have these samples and we're running them around in, in, in parks and we do it for different reasons. So some of them are running without any customers just to validate that they're not crashing or bumping into things. And we can also get user data or, or uh, vehicle data on, on how it's keeping the lanes or as you see in this image is actually, or this video is actually going in the middle of the lane. So that's maybe not what it's supposed to do. Um, and, and you can get data in different ways. So we have the, the people working in the parks and they are actually running around with this vehicle just to validate the autonomous drive system in it. And the next part of the, of the business model is that will it convert into sales? If you know that the market is big enough, you have tested it and you have done your calculations on it, you know that you can sign up the park so they can put the vehicles in front of people. You know that the vehicle can drive by themselves. They can go around and they can yeah, get to the, the pandas or they can go to the restaurant and stuff like that. They will not crash. The last part is, will it convert into sales? Will people actually sign up? And this is something you can do with prototypes as well, because you can put it in front of people. Here, what you think doesn't matter. This is, I think, the, the biggest part, what you think it doesn't matter, because this is only what other people, people think. And you can't really ask them, because if you go out and ask them, would you like this service? Most people say yes. But if you just put it there and ask them for their money, they need to pay for it. Then you get a different answer. And if they need to pay for it, it should be the authentic experience. So we put it out in the park. Of course, want people to line up to these vehicles and rent it. Let's see if we can run this one. Can you? Yeah. And we got people to sign up and rent the vehicle and to go around. And of course, we follow them closely to look at how they behave and what to do and so on. But we're running this test for basically all of autumn. And we had, I don't know how many, but hundreds of, of customers and, and we took two other vehicles and been running for real clients. Here you see some of the other like competitor vehicles passing by there. They look awkward, I think. Um, and you get real data if people actually like it, if they actually pay for it. And then you have proof of how the technology works, how big the market is, how you can access the market, and also how, how many people are converting into sets. This is kind of good for testing your business model and how to, to run it into a, a bigger company, which goes into how to scale her up. 
That was a short introduction to uh, Golden Rich Robotic. I hope you liked it and understand. We can tell you a, a lot of more things about this one. So if you have any questions or so, please come back and, and ask us directly. I think you know how to reach us. Um, we're going to continue talking a little bit about IoT and technology, how to do this for other type of machines and, and uh, applications. Yeah, exactly. Because this, this vehicle is obviously quite capable. It's running a autonomous drive uh, technology, big computers, you got connectivity built right in, but there's tons of, of machines and vehicles that, that doesn't have this luxury. They, they might be running very simple uh, control units, embedded systems, but, but they would also benefit from being connected, right? So you, you say there, there's a difference in like connectivity, IoT, or a, a, just a simple modem, or? Yeah, I, I would say so, that, that we, we've experienced when talking to a little bit smaller companies that have smaller volumes, but they, they clearly see the benefit of connecting their vehicle, but having an issue getting that uh, off the ground. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was frustrating for us because we didn't find like an off-the-shelf solution where we could just kind of take a, a modem and just stick it in so that we can start doing what we do good, which is application development and uh, service development. So, I mean, we decided to, to just put together our own uh, IoT connection. I think this is interesting because if you look at Golden Rich here, it's a brand new platform. Everything is new. It's running an NVIDIA multi-core platform and it has computer vision, 3D vision, and a lot of stuff. And the whole structure of the product is actually new from the beginning. But if you take most of other applications, like a washing machine, or it could be within our agriculture, or it could be different heavy tools and so on, the machine itself is usually already there. And you cannot just say, let's change everything. We want a same, same type of computer as in a MacBook Pro. That's not possible. I mean, in the Golden Ridge part, that was built from scratch. We could build connectivity in from natively from the beginning. Mm. But we, we've been working several years with many different projects and uh, started to, uh, to build a, uh, see if we can get some slides back up again. <laughs> started to build like a, a bunch of platforms that we want to leverage so we more quickly can go in and, and build value and, and uh, business value into into our uh, uh, projects. Uh, go from left here, we, we worked a lot with Bluetooth, so we made a platform called Beckon, which is uh, just makes it much, much easier to do Bluetooth on smartphones, Android and iOS. Uh, we did, uh, I think Joel mentioned, we do a lot of concept cars, and uh, you know, when, if, if the first time you demo something is on stage at CES, where the CEO stands there, you press a button, you really want it to work. So we built this thing called Demo Fabric, which enables us to do this uh, proof of concepts and demonstrators and one-offs without you know, having too much uh, uh, sweat and tears. So mm. And then finally, we have something we're going to deep dive into right now, which is uh, our uh, IoT platform, you can say, called Elevate. And uh, we started this work, uh, maybe if I can switch it. Started this work, um, not so long ago, like yeah. six months ago. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. Uh, just out of like, well, we thought like, why it's, it feels the, the, the technology is mature now, so we can take these building blocks and put it together. And, and yeah, this, this doesn't really make sense when you first listen to it. Why do we build our own? Mm. I got this question too as a CEO of the company. I want to build our own IT solution. It's like, isn't that really existing on the market yeah, already? Yeah. And that's kind of what uh, a lot of our clients say as well. Like, why, we're not going to build our own. I mean, that we have to take something off the shelf. Now, what happens if you take something off, off your shelf? I mean, on the you, shelf? You, you, you quickly realize that, OK, you, uh, you can get something up and running. But as soon as you start looking at your particular use cases, maybe you have a sensor that you need to connect, or you have to interface with your control units. I mean, already there, you start to see the need for adapting it to your needs. Mm. And uh, from our experience, the more control you have, the easier it is to adapt, right? Mm. And do it quickly, because that's the key here, right? Time to market is key. You have to be able to do it quickly. And uh, with, with, with this platform, we, we thought, we're not going to build an IoT company. 
we're going to build a na- an enabler mm. for uh, helping companies change their business model. Uh, so kind of short circuit is this connectivity issue and is enable that so we can start building the, the services on top. We, we noticed that a lot of uh, our clients that had a, a problem with scale. Mm. Uh, like you scaling up or scaling down or? Just in terms of volume, or how, how many units you're producing or, or launching per, per year. Mm. I mean, if you're Apple, you're building millions of iPhones, it's not a problem. But if you're building 1,000 uh, connected pumps, uh, connected pumps each year, or or, uh, or five hundred uh, compactors, mm. or uh, you know two thousand forklifts, you know you you have to you, get, you run into problem with having to pick something off the shelf, not really suiting your particular needs, and then you kind of have to do a lot of trade offs that is uncomfortable. Right? So. How, how can we fix this? The thing is that if you, if you go and you're going to build a, a large scale series and you can go to Bosch or Delphi or, or these companies, they usually, they, they will be happy and they can help you and they're, they're really good at it. Um, but if you're running a smaller business and you want to start with an initial series of like a thousand units or even a hundred or even 10 units, it starts to become tricky. Mm-hmm. And then on the other end of the scale, you want to test something and you want to run it like one, two units. Then you can hack it together and you can run whatever technology. But then when you want to validate and test your business model, for example, you maybe want to run 10, 20, 50 units. Mm. And that hand-built unit is is quite hard. Mm. So we saw a gap between the big manufacturers and a really hands-on hack prototype. Definitely a gap. We 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 noticed this with uh, a few other clients. We had uh, they got a connectivity platform up and running, simple uh, MQTT connection to your cloud. Can, can can you show and tell a little bit about what we're actually yeah, doing? Sure. And, and yes, one one, one say platform and one what do you call it? Uh, anecdote first. So so we had this company doing a ride sharing of uh, small vehicles, and they had this system up and running, but they ran into problem right away and asked us for help because we had uh, our team in Shenzhen, so we could kind of be on site. But so their problem problem was that there was one guy at uh, this uh, their supplier who was responsible for the firmware for, for this connectivity mm-hmm. solution. And, what, and and what's a firmware? So the, the software that you run on on your uh, embedded device. And how come the firmware is hard to work with? Then? It's not hard to work with firmware, but if you don't have the source code, then it's, it's hard. very hard. <laughs> it's very hard. Right? <laughs> so so the, so we actually had to help them go to the factory, find that one guy, mm-hmm. and before he went on vacation for Chinese New Year, have him like sit and fix the bugs and issues they have with connectivity, mm-hmm. right? So that does just show like, if you're not in control over the whole stack, you you, you can run into unfortunate problems quite, quite bad. But uh, uh, let me see, let's show a little bit more concrete what it is in an IoT platform or how we see it. So yeah, you can play that. So uh, in this, this kind of showcase an example of a, like, some, some ride sharing, everyone is familiar with these kick bikes on the streets. Mm, so this is something you would do. You would make an application on a smartphone. You would have some kind of cloud uh, platform, and then you would have hardware and firmware running on your product, like it be a forklift or a kick mm. bike or uh, anything. But this looks like uh, there is a lot of kickbacks on the street. What, what isn't this already done? If you want to run multiple, like uh, half a million kickbacks on the street, mm. can yeah. you buy that solution today? Yeah, you could. You, you can. Could. Yeah. But that's not the they can because they have the volume, and they can also buy maybe a specific vertical uh, for that particular use case. Exactly. But if you you're not uh, in the business of renting out kick bikes, like what do you do that? Like? Or clicks, yeah, maybe. Yeah, exactly. You you have a. Uh, a uh, water-powered uh, concrete uh, cutting device, cutting device, or or uh, or whatever. Like you, just, you, but you see clearly so, a need to to kind of have predictive maintenance, fleet management, rental model, all these kind of. Things. So it, it it seems like we have a a physical device, a machine we want to connect, and we have an application. How are they talking to each other? What's the main components behind it? 
so if I'm gonna like nerd down a bit and deep dive here, so we have uh, we have our uh, hardware that you have to connect to, uh, to you connect to your device. And then we can zoom in here. And teacher, if you can go like full screen a bit. I don't need that. What do you need? My, my the camera. Feed. Oh, we can do this here. Yeah. Is the mic connected? Uh, yeah. Let's if you can go like full screen on, on the camera, let's show the guys here. Like, so, so this, I mean, you have you have your uh, hardware component, uh, and we we haven't gone like super tiny in size because our use case is mostly like big, bigger machines and uh, space is not a constraint. So then we save money and, and just keep it like reasonably big. Uh, so you have this hardware, and on this hardware you have firmware running. Uh, software that communicates with uh, whatever host system mm -hmm. it is, and then it talks to to uh, a server, a cloud computer, over two G connection or four G connection. But uh, I think the interesting part is that this this thing is kind of common for everything. So you can put this in a in a kick bike, mm -hmm. and a forklift, and a machine, whatever. But the interesting part is like how do you how do you interface with your particular uh, use case and then it's when, when this guy comes in in handy so this is our development prototyping board and if this connectivity uh, module is the same for every use case this uh, integration board can vary depending on what kind of machine and interface you have and you can simply just slide this in and and you have your connectivity. So say, for example, you have CAN connection, you have a UART connection, or you need a sensor, like a temperature sensor, an accelerometer. You can put that on this integration. I think but you... The shift that we see right now in the industry is that instead of just today, people are not buying heavy tools and machines. You're more and more renting them, actually. and, and Instead of buying them, you're just renting them for a few days when you need to do the work. And what we see is shifting here is that this rental business is based on days usually and not based on usage. And all of these machines, they're quite often using some, some sort of like, like paper or they're consuming some sort of material. And, and that is linked to how much you use it. And the business model of these manufacturers today, they want to move into charging for the actual use and the work that the machine produces. Mm -hmm. You have the same thing with a washer machine where the, the white goods manufacturer, they want to pivot into charging for the detergent, not just the machine. Mm -hmm. Or the wash, like a paper wash. Paper oh, wash yeah. would be a, another good one. Yeah. Exactly. So again, to, to repeat, like the, this is, uh, we, we feel that technology is mature enough for a company like us to put this together and, uh, and, and just enable the connectivity. It mm -hmm. should be there. Uh, so do we intend to sell these in big numbers or what's our business model behind it? I mean, our business model is, is still to, to be the product developer and partner to, to exactly. roll out the service and then uh, uh, it's not, and we, we don't think the IoT subscription model works because mm -hmm. these companies we talk to, they, it doesn't fit their business model. So we will not charge per unit we sell, or what do we, will we host it here, or where are we hosting it? it, it I say we could, uh, depends on who we work with. Some, some companies mm -hmm. have a capable IT department and they can host it themselves. Uh, Others, they're more familiar with the hardware and building machines, and they 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 don't have this capacity, and then we can help. Mm. And uh, everyone has their unique needs and arrangements, I would say. So what are we looking at now here? It, it's a okay, bunch so, of blue stacks on, yeah, the, on top of this one. Same, it's a little bit funny picture, but but I mean, I, I mentioned before how how important it is to quickly prototype and test your hardware with. Uh, in, in real life, and this is what you talked about in the Golden Ridge case as well. Mm. We have to get it out there and see, does it work? What are the issues? What are the problems? We, we have to get out of the office and on the desk pretty quickly. So uh, Arduino, I think many of you are familiar with, but it's a mm, kind of prototyping hardware uh, that you can readily buy at you know any store online or and shell, what, shell what can, you, can you give an example of what you can so, connect with? So for example, say that you 
have like a, a camera or yeah a, say you have a need for sensor. say you have a need for like a particular uh kind of uh, accelerometer maybe mm. you can just get an accelerometer shield put it onto the our prototyping development board and get the signal from that and then send to to the back end for analysis or or temperature or, uh, or level some, of a tank, or yeah, you want to measure how many pellets you have in, in yeah, a, in exactly, a pellet yeah, burner. Yeah, exactly. So uh, quickly prototype, and then you can go from there to uh, a custom production integration board. Uh, in the matter of of, of uh, the prototyping is matter of days, weeks, and then going to production matter of months. Let's see. I don't know, we should talk about this a little bit. We, we... And how does, I think there's a question also, how does Elevate relate to um, Arduino? How do they combine with each other? What's the unique part about Elevate combining it with our Arduino? Jacob here, sitting here <laughs> off, off screen, uh, relaying some questions from the chat, I guess. Yeah. Uh, so uh, the relationship, since this uh, mm, uh, Elevate board we're running is uh, Nordic Semiconductor Microcontroller. Uh, it runs uh, your standard C and Rust uh, embedded uh, code. Uh, and what Arduino brings is just a standard on how to uh, connect things with the input-output pins. So uh, we can take this uh, kind of consumer prototyping board that Arduino provides and connect it, and we will know which, which pins to, to kind of receive and send data on. And I think the interesting part here is that the IoT device and, and the Elevate platform is actually production ready. So this is part of the, this will be in production for the products we're building. Yeah. This is the same hardware that we're using in production. Yeah. But then we have the ability to add on prototyping to it. So you can start working on your real cloud, and we can deploy the real cloud on yeah. AWS or something. Exactly. We can start working on the real the user apps, the user apps, yeah. and also the real vehicle communicate. If it is a vehicle, it's running like a yeah, CAM network, mm -hmm. so we, we have the proper CAM communication and so on. Yeah. But then we can quickly prototype, and we can combine this, mm -hmm. for example, with a special touch sensor or something mm -hmm. that is yet not adapted to the vehicle. Yeah. If you have safety sensors, for example, it, it should uh, understand if, if the mm -hmm. people operating the machine is having the safety equipment and stuff. I would say this, it's just a sensible kind of way to quickly enable prototyping. Mm -hmm. It's just go with this very open standard of how to do I.O. between small microcontrollers. And it's just to, to uh, make it clear, this, this uh, platform built this is microcontrollers, so it's not a microprocessor. It's not like you, what you have in your your smartphone. It's not mm -hmm. running an operating system with Linux. It's still a uh, very uh, lightweight and then cost efficient. But they are pretty powerful nowadays. We can do uh, cool stuff with these, these little tiny devices. And we have a screen tilt. Why do we have a screen? Why do we have a screen? Yeah. So again, I mean, we we don't uh, sit and think about use cases we hear from our customers like yes. what is what are their needs and we found uh, maybe you can explain like so we, we we found the problem with a screen is maybe not the cost of for the screen itself the the main issue we're trying to attack here is the is the size issue so if you're the volume, the volume issue that if you're building your machines in in units of thousands uh, the, the, the cost of the screen and the, the device, the communication device, will be much more than the R&D, uh, much less than the R&D cost. So just the manpower to get it to work will be so high. Mm -hmm. And we had a number of requests that an IoT device connecting the machine, and you can do this predictive maintenance and cool business model behind it with, with rental services and stuff. But quite often, don't you need to communicate this to the end user? Mm -hmm. and, and how do you communicate it mm -hmm. if the machine just doesn't work? And, or if you haven't paid for mm -hmm. more, more work for the machine? And the thing, the difference is that if you do a consumer uh, product or if you do your own private product, you mm -hmm. can use a mobile app. Mobile yeah. app is good for that one. And you yeah. can use the mobile phone for communicating. Yeah. But if you have a professional device, Mm -hmm. Like a cleaning robot for a 
a cleaning machine for hospitals. We can't use a mobile app and expect all cleaners mm -hmm. to download the mobile app and to use an account for it. Yeah. We need a machine itself to actually be able exactly. to communicate. And also the, the smartphone ecosystem is a moving target. I mean, it mm. constantly changes. A lot of costing is keeping that up. So having something at least solid that works on your machine, it makes a lot of sense. So uh, we, we developed a, uh, a screen, a uh, high brightness display works outside. Uh, and it's also powered by a microcontroller system. So again, it's not a big heavy handed Linux Android system where you need to worry about like, uh, security and apps update and all kinds of things. It's just purposeful, small, tiny, low cost, but still a little bit more fun than these traditional segment displays that yes. you'll see in the uh, common. So, and of, of course we made this play What's, light, what's the difference light. between a segment display and an LCD display? I mean, a segment display, you would have a, you would have like fixed set of graphics that you could show. Yeah. Whereas uh, in a, in an, if you have an LCD, uh, you have pixels, right? So, uh, say 800 times 480 uh, pixels, and you can show whatever you want. Basically, I have a video uh, later show it as an example of a quick prototype we built on this platform. Um, you can play this. Uh, so, this is just how. We spent like uh, uh, maybe a few days a week to build a ride sharing prototype on top of this Elevate platform. And there you see top left corner is the uh, HMI module uh, with the display. And when uh, we now press on, on an unlock button on, on your smartphone, uh, a signal goes to our cloud, uh, through the cloud down to our uh, IoT module, and then over a CAN connection to the HMI module, we can change the mode from lock to unlock. And obviously, we will communicate with the host vehicle as well, in this case, the desktop demo. Um, but this, this is kind of just an example of what you can build on top of the elevator platform. And it, the, the purpose is to be able to do these things quickly when you, mm -hmm. when you have the baseline there and the reusability. So we can address these kind of volume issues, these kind of you have small volumes, but you still, you, it, it will be too cost, uh, costly to develop it from scratch for each and every product or segment. But so if, if we take an example, and let's say we want to build a connected uh, sharing, because it's spring and you should be outside and not indoors because of this virus, and you want to take care of your garden. So let's say we're going to build a garden device like a chainsaw. Mm -hmm. And you want to have it in a rent <laughs> in a rental service, right. or yeah. maybe a lawnmower, a little uh, bit bigger one, yeah. I think. Yeah. And you want to have it in a rental service. How fast could you get a prototype up and working and testing it in in like one sample with a deployed cloud and everything up and up and running? I mean, we're talking a matter of days or weeks, so say for the first kind of validation prototype. And where are we running that? That in that case, are we running the the, the IoT, uh, not the IoT, or running the cloud here? Is it an existing service or did yeah, you set so, up a new one? Or? So, so we built the cloud service to be uh, like redeployable, like a container. So you have this, this cloud package and you can put it on your, your company's infrastructure server or a server mm -hmm. you have in your closet or like we can help just put it up on Google or Amazon. It's a kind of a one click deploy and then it's up there for, for you. And then the cool thing is that you would own the whole chain from your, was it lawnmower? Yeah. To uh, your cloud solution to down to the, the app that, that you own. So we, cause we see this kind of, the bigger companies, they see the value in all the data. They want to control and own that. So. But that must apply to everyone. That the value is in all the data you collect. So, so you want to be able to control the whole chain. I think coming back to this, having a control over the whole product is is kind of key to to success for a lot of things. This uh, uh, cool. Products. And and how much of that can you reuse into production? If you built that prototype in in let's say a month and mm -hmm. or two, and you get the prototype. So yeah. you can test the lawnmower with a little screen, and you can see you can rent it, then you can rent mm -hmm. it, and then you can go run it. How, how much of that can you, is that a one-off, or is it reusable for 
I would say it's very reusable. So, so a lot of things you build in that prototype is just the first step. So when you do any kind of product development, mm -hmm. you prototyping, prototyping is like you do drafts and you keep improving on these drafts. So th this, uh, the first prototype we talked about in a matter of weeks or days, that's the first step. And then we move that along towards manufacturing. So the key mm -hmm. is always to build it to be able to be manufactured. So at, at no point we would like to say, oh, okay, cool, the case works. Now let's find the real IoT solution. It's, it should be a continuous kind of work towards uh, the final. And I mean, at the end, when you launch, it doesn't stop there. Yeah. That's when it continues. That's when you, uh, you know, improve manufacturing, optimize. You start collecting data, like in Golden Rich, like we can tweak, we can adjust. So. Yeah, I think this is, the, this is key to it that. Basically, what you do is to sketch it down on a piece of paper and say, this is our new digital business model. Mm -hmm. That is fine, but you need to get validate the technology that people actually want to rent this lawnmower. Mm -hmm. You need to validate that you can actually connect it and that, that, that it does work, that you can unlock it and you can do all of these things. Yeah. And you need to validate that, that you can run it into a like, scaler up and so on. There are so many things you need to validate yeah. and you should move into real things quite fast mm -hmm. and this is the main purpose that we felt that we got stuck with so many clients mm -hmm. working together with another supplier mm -hmm. third-party supplier building the iot or they had a subscription a sauce model for yeah connecting the vehicles or mm -hmm. connecting the machines and so mm -hmm. but usually you just got a simple on off switch mm -hmm. and you could get uh, gps yeah. coordinates or something like that and, and you need much more control over it. That's why we have we felt like we have to build this our, our, ourselves. Yeah, yeah. And, and it's, instead of moving into a, a traditional sauce model where we try to sell this device here, we moved into and said like, we just need the firmware for it. We need to be in control and be able to, to use it. And then we understand that you guys, you need to be in control and own it. Yeah. So we're sharing it with you guys, and the business model behind us is that we want to build the service, we want to build the infrastructure and the whole setup. This is what we do, yeah. and we offer you to actually own it. So it's a quite different business model from us. So, yeah, I think that's what puts it a little bit apart, right? The, yeah. the sharing of the, the tech stack, because we saw the volume issue, and we saw the sales models doesn't work. So. That's our approach. Cool. Yeah. I think we're going to wrap up. Uh, yeah, could end maybe with elaborating on one of the key questions. Uh, sure. We had two good questions. One was this about what is unique in Elevate compared to our Dino boards. The other comment around that was that you can find all kinds of Arduino shields for various purposes, but the real challenge comes when you integrate software for each shield. Mm -hmm. um, so elaborate a bit upon that and how we leverage Elevate in this context. So I would say in there is a baseline of software you need to build for the IoT solution and mm -hmm. that we have. And then like the question uh, is, okay, but what do you do with all these unique things you need and you can experiment with Arduino? And then one thing uh, I think is a great advantage with what we built is we're using Rust uh, and this is a, I would say, like a modern take on the very traditional go-to language that is C. But with Rust, we were able to build uh, type safety. We were able to build a, a more modular setup where we faster can build something that's stable and testable. Um, and but the thing is, you cannot get away from that. For, for every every use case, you need to make some kind of adaption, some kind of software development. Mm -hmm. But what we try to do with this platform is make sure we find a baseline and make sure that we are able to quickly adapt it to these unique use cases and in a, in a stable way yeah. and a quick way. Uh, but but it comes back to the ownership, right? So. Buying something uh, off the shelf and then running into the wall, like, okay, now we need to tweak this, we need to adjust that, and then you, can, you can't, right? Uh, so the unique part of Elevate is the, the shared model where we are willing to kind of go in and co-own this with our clients. So it goes both ways. So we work with 
one client and we share everything and then in terms we we can use it for for mm. client another client of course not the the business critical or the, the, the secret stuff but the, the kind of the core uh connectivity stuff. this today is more of infrastructure for building digital business model and, yeah, and yeah. It, infrastructure is something with low value and it should be just working yeah so you should build your value on top of this one, which is yeah. your core yeah. business, yeah. and then let's yeah. just without, get it to work. Down, downplaying it, but in, in a sense, this is not key, right? This should just be there and work. Yes. And you, there are others out there, but I think the, the diff differentiator is the service that we can build on top of it, and the control we are uh, mm. willing to give uh, our partners in, in the platform. We have uh, just one minute left, so I think if, if Jacob, what do you say? Yeah. So I cool. think we're going to say thank you for watching and I hope that you got something out of this. And um, even though digital is the future and everything, I really do hope that we can meet and we can share a espresso and actually do some work face to face because that, that's also part of the future, I think. Yeah. And um, thank you for watching. Keep safe.